Good morning, everyone. Happy Palm Sunday. Can you believe we're there already? So happy that you're with us all today. Uh, my name is Jane Rideout. If you're the first time you're with us, I am one of the co-lead pastors along with my husband, Gary, who will bring the message today. And so I wanna give you a few announcements while we're still kind of scurrying around here. Um, the very first thing is that we have a Lenten community dinner this Wednesday night. And we are filling up, and if you would like to join us, and we would love for you to join us, we always have a really good meal. We have great chefs here. You need to sign up at saumc.life by noon tomorrow. So if you'd like to come to the dinner, it will be wonderful, but just be sure to sign up by noon tomorrow. Also, because this is Holy Week, we have very special services. On Thursday, we're gonna have a Monday Thursday service, and that service is at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary. If you have little, little kids, we will have nursery for zero through four, but the older kids will come to worship with you and it'll be time of celebrating communion just as Jesus celebrated communion with his friends on that Thursday night. On Friday, we have our Good Friday service at 7 p.m. as well. Again, the same with nursery for zero through four. And that's what we call a service of darkness, which means that throughout the evening, we'll be reading scriptures, we'll be singing songs, and it will get darker and darker. And it's a space to reflect on the meaning of Good Friday, the loss that was experienced, the, the sacrifice that Christ made for us. I always feel like you need to make the spaces for Holy Week so that Easter can have the fullness and the, and the celebration to it that it, it needs to have and it deserves. So on Thursday, you'll have a place of, of reflection in the communion and on Friday in the service of darkness. And it will make your Easter that much richer. And then on Easter, we will celebrate the risen Christ. There'll be four services. The first service will be at 6.30 a.m. in the courtyard. It's a sunrise service. You bring your own chair. You bring your mug of coffee. And if it's cold, bring a jacket. But we've been doing this the last couple of years. It's really quite wonderful. We just meet in the courtyard. And that's at 6.30. And then we'll have our regular services at 8.15 traditional, at 9.45 contemporary, and at 11.15 traditional again. It will be a glorious Sunday but I just fully encourage you to take advantage of the other services as well so that you can prepare your heart for the celebration on Easter morning. So now let's all stand and greet each other in the name of the risen Christ.
have a children's moment now so kids you just sit down is there any other kids in here today that would like to come down for the children's moment we would love to have you you could just come sit on the steps if you feel brave enough I know sometimes that's kind of hard to do so anybody else come on down here we got some girls in the back and if we get halfway through and you change your mind you can come down at any point okay you're allowed to do that so come have a seat on the steps all right there you go any side there we go Okay, so I've got a children's moment for you. First of all, do you guys know what with the week that this is Holy Week? Do you ever heard that before? Holy Week means people who love Jesus, people who call themselves Christians, have a special week, and it's this week, and lots of important things happen. Today is called Palm Sunday, and this is the day that Jesus comes into Jerusalem, and that's why you guys were singing, because people sang and celebrated when he came. But there's other important days too. On Thursday, that's the day we're going to all gather because we're going to have communion because Jesus had communion with his disciples, with his best friends on the Thursday before Friday. On Friday, it's called Good Friday, which is kind of a strange name because it's the day that died on the cross. And so we come in and we have a, a service where it makes us remember what he did for us and the sadness around that. And then Easter right? You guys come back and we celebrate the celebration. But I want to talk about something really just quickly that happened on that very first day. Because there was a character, actually two characters in this story, that didn't know it was going to be a really special day. 
So Jesus gave some instructions in Matthew 21 to his disciples, and he told them to do this. This is what Jesus said to these people to do. This is before he got to Jerusalem. He said, go into the village over there, and as soon as you enter, you will find a donkey tied up and a colt with it. A colt is the baby. It's like that's the mama donkey and her baby. Untie them and bring them to me, and if anybody says anything to you, say, the Lord needs it. So basically, was he wanted a donkey that he could ride into Jerusalem on, and that's what he did. But the interesting thing is, when that donkey woke up that day, she didn't know she was going to have a special job. She was just minding her own business, taking care of her baby, but God gave her a special job. And it got me to thinking, he gives us all special jobs too. Sometimes we don't know how important it is. Some of the jobs that he gives us are being kind to people. If you see someone at school who doesn't have a friend, you should be friendly to them. If you see someone that looks sad, you should smile at them. You should forgive people who are cranky. And sometimes that means your brothers and sisters, right? Jesus asks us to do the hard thing, but he asks us, to do special things like that, to be kind to people, even when they make us mad, to be kind and to forgive them. And like that donkey who had a very special job, what do we know about her? We don't know her name, and we don't know her baby's name, but we all know about her because she had such an important job. And you may not know how God is going to make the job you do important, but he will. Now, later on, when you guys go out for the Easter egg hunt, you know it's going to be out there? I think three donkeys. Is it three? Yes, okay, three. It's two adult miniature donkeys and a baby donkey. So we get to see a baby donkey as well. And those donkeys came today for us to remember we all have special jobs to do, just like that donkey a long time ago that Jesus got to ride on. Do you think you can remember that? All right, let's close our eyes. I'm going to say a quick prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us jobs that we can do. Thank you for not forgetting us, just like you did not forget that donkey. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, do you guys want to go back to your seats? You remember where mom and dad are sitting? Okay, you can get up and head back to your seats. And if mom and dads, if they look lost, wave your arms, okay? Here we go. Good job. Bennett, excuse me, for the affirmation of faith. Please join me in the creed. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God, the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as a divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in the time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. It is at this time we enter a time of prayer. 
And as always, during the, the, the silent time at the beginning of the prayer, if you want to come forward and kneel at the rail, please do. I do want to tell you about the one prayer concern that the church has been praying for for a long time. His name is Jason Long. Uh, he is a young, young, young man in his early 40s. He's had health issues uh, for about a year now. He's been in the hospital in Miami for, for about a year. He's got a wife, Stephanie, and a young son, Camden, and, and, and a teenager. We've been praying for him. He's had four, maybe five organ transplants, and he's been, uh, he's, he's been up and down the whole year. Well, it looks like his body is finally wearing out, and uh, he doesn't have much long here, unless it, we pray, unless there's a miracle. So please be in prayer for Jason and the family. Stephanie's going down there now, and uh, pray for the family in, in, in this time of, of a very troubling time. So now let's begin, with, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's begin with a moment of silent prayer. Almighty God, we confess it is so easy for us to live selfishly and carelessly, to line the roads for Jesus the way those many did on the first Palm Sunday without understanding what it means to be committed to you and the truth for which you died. We go through each day living out lives, living our lives without ever thinking of you, listening to you, praising your name. Show us a better way, O oh Lord, and draw us into you. May this be a time in our lives where we are changed and renewed. Be revealed to each of us so strongly in our hearts and our minds that we may be transformed into true followers of our Lord and Savior and not just bystanders. We pray for those in our midst who are grieving, who have suffered and are suffering, those whose hearts have been broken with sorrow, whether it's a loss of a loved one or a loss of someone, something precious to them. We pray for those who are sick, ailing, recovering from surgery, either at home or in the hospital. And we especially lift up prayers for Jason Long and his family during this troubling time. Father, you know us and you love us. You have called us to be your followers, and we ask you today to help us to answer that call, not with just lip service only, but with all of our lives. The path we must follow doesn't promise to be easy, but we know will ultimately lead to life more abundant. Remove all fear and doubt from our minds and help us say only yes. We love you, Father, and we want to follow you. Thank you for using us to further your kingdom. May we answer your call with obedience. We offer all these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're now going to move into a time of stewardship, and for some of you who are new today, um, our tradition changed during COVID. We stopped passing a plate. Um, it just got a little bit risky at times, and so instead, we have baskets here, a basket in the front, and we have them also in the back, and during this next anthem, you are encouraged to get up and give as God leads you to give, but that's where those baskets will be. And of course, you can always give online. There's four ways that you can give online as well, because again, the world's changing. Everybody wants to do it a little bit differently. I want to just say one moment here, take a moment to express some gratitude to you. Uh, I am particularly proud on Palm Sunday that we, because of your generous giving, have a vibrant children's ministry, and we are able to offer these Easter egg hunts and that's because of all of you, 
Because of your faithful giving, we have a ministry that we can share with our community. And so I thank you for that. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for listening to the nudge of God who encourages us to share. And I thank you for your faithfulness in all that you do throughout the year. But I feel particularly grateful today seeing all the kids here. So that, that is a blessing to us. So now during this next piece, please feel free to get up and move if you feel so inclined. Please bow your heads as we say this prayer. Holy God, sovereign over power and pain, glorious triumph and deep disappointment, we enter this holy week bringing our tithes and offerings to your altar and leaving them here in the hope that you will use them to make the world a more loving and compassionate place. We are reminded through the scripture that you sent two of your disciples out to make the world ready for our, your coming. Go into the village. Find the donkey. Tell them that the Lord has need. Remind us that your kingdom breaks into the world, not as a spectacle for us to witness, but as a parade, parade where we are called to make a working contribution. We pray in the name of the one who comes not just for the parade, but for the cross at the end of it. Amen.
Well, if you have been with us during the season of Lent, uh, you will know that um, the, season, the season of Lent was a 40 days before Easter, not counting Sundays. You know that we as a church have been going through, journeying through the gospel of, of Matthew, taking a journey through that with daily readings and devotions. In our daily readings, I don't know if you noticed, but um, we skipped over the Palm Sunday scripture, and we we're saving it for today. So for today is Palm Sunday. We'll read that passage. So here, the Palm Sunday passage is Jesus entering the gates, humbly riding on a donkey. So let's look at this passage in Matthew that describes his entry into the city, fully knowing what lies ahead for him, his, trial, his arrest, his trial, and ultimately painful death on the cross. So let's look at the passage. When they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus gave two disciples a task. He said to them, Go into the village over there. As soon as you enter, you will find a donkey tied up and a colt with it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that their master, the master needs them. He sent them off right away. Now this happened to fulfill what the prophet said. Say to daughter Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and riding on a donkey, and on a colt the donkey's offspring. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had ordered them. They brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on them. Then he sat on them. Now a large crowd spread, uh, spread their clothes on the road. Others cut palm branches off the trees and spread them on the roads. The crowds in front of him and behind him shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up. Who is this? They asked. The crowd answered, It's the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now you could say that everybody was kind of maybe looking for a showdown uh, here this Palm Sunday. Jesus had been bringing the message to, of, of God's love and grace to the people in such a powerful way. People have been observing his many miracles and his healings. They've listened and raptured to the stories and teachings about living the way of God, principles to live by, and the truth behind all the parables that Jesus was saying. Yet his teachings and actions, they've not gone over, over well with some people. The religious leaders saw him as a, the political leaders saw him as a threat. The religious leaders saw him as a heretic. On the first Palm Sunday, everyone seems to have a foreboding that something is going to happen in Jerusalem. All eyes were on Jesus as he rises to Jerusalem humbly on a donkey amidst this shout of praise for him. Today the masses are singing Jesus' praise among the shouts of hallelujah. Yet in about four days he'll be demands by the masses to crucify him. What a switch, what a change. Now all faithful Jews would know that people would be gathering in the Jerusalem at this time, the 15th day of Nisan, now, that's not a car. That's a, that's a Hebrew month of the Hebrew calendar. They would be gathering to celebrate the festival of Passover. The festival of Passover marks the Jewish festival in the spring, which commemorates the liberation of the Israelites from Egyptian slavery. Kind of celebrates the, their birth as the Hebrew nation. So all Jewish males were required to make three pilgrimages to, to uh, Jerusalem, if they could, and those three festivals all connected with the people's deliverance from the slavery in Egypt, which we call the Exodus. There's Pentecost. That's celebrated the culmination of the Exodus. They were at the, mount, at, the, at the foot of Mount Sinai. There's also the Festival of Booths or Tabernacles, which actually commemorates the whole 40-year journey after leaving Egypt, Egypt, where they constructed makeshift tents along their journey. And the third one, of course, is Passover. So at this time, when Jesus entered the city, it was busting at the seams. People, multitude of Jewish people were gathering for the festival, including Jesus, because you remember he was a faithful Jew. You could almost say, say that the trip was, for many, uh, this trip had been made numerous times each year as being devoted followers of God. You could almost say this trip was in kind of monotonous, a routine. Each year was the same thing, the same route they took the same rituals at the temple, the same prayers. What should have been a high holy day for the people kind of lost its appeal and meaning. 
had become stale and rote for many. Some were just going through the motions of the day. For many, it was really a tremendous burden to travel so away from the homeland, leaving their livelihood and their families behind. At this point, they were clamoring, clamoring for something more, something different than what their religion was offering. Enter Jesus. Reports of his teaching, his healing, his faithful followers that trailed him everywhere and his confrontations with religious and political leaders, they heard about that. They'd been spreading throughout the land. And now he'd come into Jerusalem and couple that with the rumor that he is the long-awaited Messiah that the prophets of old have been foretelling about. Suddenly, there was great hope and expectation. Here was one who could give them what their religion could not give. As cherished as your traditions were, their rituals, their temple rites, many began to sense that there was something lacking. Jesus could possibly be the one who could fill that emptiness they were feeling in their religion. Jesus could have been the one they were expecting. And everyone was clamoring to see a glimpse of him. On that first Palm Sunday, the traction was more for Jesus than their religious observation, we could say. Jesus had appealed to the common folk, the everyday people, the least, the last, and the lost. We read in Mark 12, 37, that as he was teaching in the temple, the large crowd listened to him with delight. With delight. They were filled with delight at his words. Had there ever been anyone else who drew such a reaction from the crowds? And Jesus did. On this first Palm Sunday in Jerusalem, known, Jerusalem known as the city of David, we can say that all eyes were on Jesus. He was attracting attention, attracting interest. Jesus was more attractive than the religious system because the religious systems had moved away from the heart of God, many fit felt. On this first Palm Sunday, it really was a confrontation, a clash between the old and the new. We can see this Jesus clash with the religious leaders, the, the, the Pharisees, we read about in Matthew 15 over the observance of one of their laws. Now in this passage, Jesus' disciples were transgressing one of the purification laws, traditions of the elders, by not washing their hands before they eat. You thought that came from your mama, but that, no, it's in the Bible, that's in the Bible. Yet Jesus calls them out asking, why is that you transgress the commandments of God's by your traditions? You see, their religious traditions allowed them to find a loophole so that they did not have to adhere to the commandment to honor the mother and father. They found a workaround, which gave them a pass from the command to provide for their parents. Jesus saying, come on, really, guys? Do you think this is what my father had intended with this command? Does this represent the heart of God by what you were doing? Just because you're following the law, but not follow it, but you're following it, but not following the heart of God. He, he said, why do you transgress the commandments of God by your traditions? On this day of Jesus' arrival into Jerusalem, humbly on a donkey, the attraction for the common people was all for Jesus. They weren't interested in all the political political, religious, or social underpinnings at that time represented what was going on in the, in the city at that time. They just wanted to see Jesus. So what was this attraction of Jesus on this first Palm Sunday? Let me give you four possibilities. The attraction for Jesus. Religion, religion emphasizes the outward. Jesus emphasizes the inward. It's not your outward actions that matter, but the condition of your heart that motivates your actions that is significant. That's what appealed to the people. Second, religion is about what you cannot do. Jesus is what, what is about what you can do. We always think of religion, of, well, you shouldn't do this, you should, all the should nots. Should do this, should, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And in a way, it, 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 those are important. But Jesus talked about the possibilities that are available in the life that he offers. Well, not what you can't do, but what you can do. Third, religion puts up barriers. Jesus pulls down barriers. Jesus was focused on bringing people in, not keeping people out because they're not one of us. And the last one, religion says, work your way. Jesus says, I am the way. 
Jesus' way was simple. Just follow me. You don't have to work or you earn your way into his graces. Salvation is offered freely as an unconditional gift. There is nothing we need to do or can do to earn that. It is offered to all, not just a select few. Follow Jesus. Don't work your way to salvation. Okay, a brief aside here, and I promise this is come, this is, there's a point to this. It may take a while, but I promise I'll get there, okay? Uh, what would you say if someone asked you, what is your favorite musical group of all time? Could you name one? There's, you know, there's so many groups to choose from. I mean, first of all, you got to think, well, you talk about rock and roll, you talk about country and Western, or are you talking about, uh, you know, you're talking about hip hop, rap, jazz, oldies, big band. Somebody at the first service mentioned an orchestra for place classical music. So you could choose from groups that are current now or popular now or groups that were, have fond memories of when you were growing up. What would be your favorite group? Way too many to choose from. You may not be able to name, but some of you could. But I say that I have a definitive answer to that question. My favorite group of all time is a group that you've probably never heard of. And they probably have the worst name for a band ever. Asleep at the Wheel. You ever heard of them? Anybody heard of them? One person. <laughs> Two people. So that's what I thought. That's what I thought. Asleep at the Wheel. Um, they've been around since the 1960s. They started as a group of hippies living at a bus in rural West Virginia, and then they eventually moved to the honky-tonk bars of Austin, Texas. It's hard to describe what kind of band it is. It's kind of a combination of country western, western swing, jazz, mixed in with a little splash of rock and roll. It's kind of clear as mud trying to define them. I dragged Jane to one of the concerts when they were playing in Orlando. We walked in and Jane looked around at the crowd. I think we were the, one of the youngest ones there. The room was filled with long-haired ex-hippies whose hair had now turned gray, with, along with a contingent of cowboy boot and cowboy hat wearing beer swigging rednecks. The look on Jane's face was classic. It's a mixture of fear combined with, who is this person that I married? Yet it isn't the outward appearance of the band, nor the clientele that follows them, nor the types of venues they perform, or their checkered past that, I, that attracts me. It's the music. It's wonderful. I love the music they play. It's the music that I like. If you look at the appearance of the band, if you look at the people that follow them, one could kind of infer my att attraction to, to them and, 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 and miss what the attraction for me is. The music, the important part. We can say the same thing about that first Palm Sunday. The crowds massed to Jerusalem for a variety of reasons. It was their religious duty. They came for political reasons. Or they came because everybody else was going there. They wanted to see what was coming to culminate with this clash of the old guard and this new voice for the people. They wanted to witness a rumble of epic proportions. Or they wanted to see this voice silenced once and for all because he was a religious heretic. Yet for many, for most, they just wanted to see Jesus. The one who was to give them hope for their desperate lives. A man who has come from God embodied with love to offer them mercy, grace, and deliverance from their burdens. What they sorely needed. Salvation from their sinful lives that weighed them down. That is still offered to us today for it's something we sorely need as well. The world today can be too overly focused on the outward appearance of religion, all the politics that are going on, the divisions in the churches that we are making the headlines, the, the abuses, the, the misconducts, the, the hypocrisy that seems to exist with them. I hear that a lot. I don't come to church because of the hypocrites. Yeah, all that exists. It does exist. Some people will say, oh, well, I'm just not into organized religion. I've been working in a church for 25 years. We're not that organized. So. <laughs> And there's no denying that all these things exist. Yet when we focus on the baggage of religion, we can miss the heart of the religion, Jesus Christ. He is the one we are to be attracted to, where our allegiances should be entrusted, who we shall put our faith in. The inward heart of our faith, not the outward appearance of it. This is what attracted the crowds on the first Palm Sunday. This is what should attract you. 
Jesus did not come to be just, just a great religious teacher with a great philosophy for life. He came to fulfill God's plan for us. That by dying on the cross, he was to reconcile us with God and everyone else, all others. Something that humanity has tried and tried to do for itself, by itself, but it can't. Only God, through Jesus Christ, can do that for the sake of all humanity so that we can live that abundant life that God created us to live, to have, be full of grace, mercy, and love, and that peace that passes all understanding that only can come from God. Here's a passage from the book of Colossians that expresses it well. Because all the fullness of God was pleased to live in him, and he reconciled all things to himself through him, whether things on earth or in the heavens, he brought peace through the blood of his cross. As we journey with Jesus through this holy week, leading up to Easter, let us not get sidetracked by all the distractions going on, or the outward appearance, or even the religious formalities, but try to focus on simply following Jesus. Follow Jesus, fix our gaze on Jesus, the one who will lead us to an abundant and eternal life. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. It is a significant day because not only is it Palm Sunday, but it's also the first Sunday of the month where we celebrate communion. We, have, we, we take the, the bread and the juice together. So those who are at home or on live stream, get ready, to get prepared to uh, get the bread and the juice, whatever you're using to uh, commemorate communion. And we remember that on this Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem and all throughout the week, he, he knew what was gonna happen. He knew what was gonna happen to him, the trials, the arrest, and his death on the cross. He knew who was going to betray him. He knew which disciple was going to deny him. But you know what? On that Monday, Thursday, the first time they sat together and had what we call communion, disciples together, he offered communion to each one of them. Didn't matter how far they strayed from him. They even offered communion to Judas, of all people of all people. And I just, just a reminder to you all too that no matter what you've done in the past, no matter where you've been, no matter your checkered past, Jesus offers you his grace, his means of grace that can be found in here in the bread and the juice so that you can be forgiven of your sins and lived a free and abundant life. We are, um, for those of you who are visiting with us today, this is a... Um, this is the, not, the, not a table of this church. Or to, you don't have to be a, a table of the Christian church. This is a table of Jesus Christ. All are open to come forward and partake of the elements. And that then includes children. Bring your children up if you like. Some would say, well, children don't really understand what's going on in communion. And I always say back to that, most adults don't know what's going on in communion. So bring your children. Bring your children and also, um, there, um, we, we're going to have communion where you come forward and receive the bread and the little cup of juice. If there's some of you here that want to have communion at your pew, we usually have those little cups. Don't see one here today. Those little cups in front of you, but we had to take them all out to get the pews moved. So if you would like to have communion at your pew and you don't have one of the little cups, please raise your hand and the ushers will bring you one. Anybody needs a cup? down here. Anybody else? Okay. Right here. Al? Al. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. So let's uh, follow through through the liturgy of the Holy Communion. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. 
We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, you formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. O oh, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you could save your people. He healed the sick. He fed the hungry, and he ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and the Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit in us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ one with each other, and one in ministry all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is the sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. I'm not going to ask those who are helping serve communion would they come forward at this time. And as we're doing this, I'm going to speak directly to those who are having communion in their pews, they're not coming up, for those who are on live stream. Uh, take the bread that you have, pull off the, the, those here, pull off the top layer, the little cup, pull out the little wafer and those at home take the bread this is the body of Christ broken for you and now take the juice this is the blood of Christ shed for you amen
Come forward down. The table is served. Where, where are we going, Jesus?
Well, uh, we recreated the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 this morning. So didn't have enough bread and juice, but we made it work, right? So let's uh, join me in the closing prayer. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourselves to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand for the closing hymn. Okay, all you kids here in this service, who's ready for an Easter egg hunt? Yay, there you go, okay. Um, what we're gonna do is I'll have the benediction, then we'll sing a short, a very short response song, okay? I promise it's short. And then you head on out there and join the Easter egg hunt. You all go out there, they've got food, they've got don three donkeys. So enjoy this uh, blessed Palm Sunday. Now receive this benediction. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge of love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessings of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.